I'm Jesse McAnally. And I am Andrew DeWolf. And I'm Brianna Jones. And welcome to Musicals with Cheese, a podcast where I try to get Andrew and Bree to like musical theater. How are we all doing today, guys? Oh, well, you know, I'm very excited to talk about the ethical implications of child labor uh, on the early uh, Victorian era Britain. And I'm very excited to just listen to y'all talk about that. I want more. Uh, what do you want, Jess? More? More what? What the fuck was he eating? Food, glorious food. Food, glorious food. That's like the only good thing to come from the show, isn't it? That one um, song. I disagree. <laughs> There's a couple other ones. I'll be honest. The only two songs I can still remember are Food, Glorious Food and Be Back Soon for whatever reason. <laughs> <laughs> In case you hadn't figured it out by our very subtle clues and the backgrounds, if you're on Patreon video, um, this week we are talking about Oliver. Oliver, Oliver, never before has a boy wanted more. Oliver, Oliver, won't ask for more when he knows what's in store. There's a dark, thin, winding staircase without any banister, which will throw him down and feed him on cockroaches served in a canister. Oliver, Oliver. What'll he do when he's turned black and blue? He will curse the day somebody named him Oliver! Oliver is a British musical with music and lyrics by Lionel Bart. The musical is based upon the 1838 novel Oliver Twist by Charles Dickens. It premiered in the West End in 1960, enjoying a long run and successful long runs on Broadway, tours, and revivals after being brought to the U.S. by producer David Merrick. Major London revivals played from 1977 to 1980, 1994 to 1998, 2008 to 2011, and on tour in the U.K. from 2011 to 2013. Additionally, its 1968 film adaptation, directed by Carol Reed, was highly successful, winning six Academy Awards, including Best Picture. Oliver received thousands of performances in British schools, becoming one of the most popular schools in like basically one of the most popular school performances ever put on. In 1963, Lionel Bart received the Tony Award for Best Original Score. Many songs are well known to the public. Oliver was one of eight UK musicals featured on Royal Mail Stamps issued in February 2011, which that's wacky. And yeah, it's it's relatively iconic. I feel like we all had a general idea of what this was before we even like were sitting down to watch it. Yeah, I mean... I'm more familiar with Oliver and Company, you know, that adaptation of Oliver, which I don't even know if you can really call it an adaptation of Oliver. It's like barely. We're hoping to do a commentary on that soon because Andrew, Andrew's really passionate about that. OK, I owned a VHS of that movie and basically only that movie for like a long time. And I watched the shit out of it. Is it good? No, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Um, and let us say right at the top, this is a Patreon request from Joseph Evans Green, um, one of our recurring patrons, um, high tier patrons, um, who also this is his second request. His first one was We Will Rock You. So you're two for two here, Joseph. Joseph, what are you what are you doing, man? What's going on, big guy? <laughs> you and your dream coach just live in your best life. Joseph, we got to talk. OK, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> uh so jess yes what do you think about oliver <laughs> oh you're pulling that shit on me oh yeah it's your turn uh, what what is it that i texted you right when i finished it before you watched it i i think you just said it was boring but i can't quite remember it, and I stand by that. I, it took me three attempts to watch the film. Um, I watched the film and then I watched a stage production because it took me a good while to find that. And then I listened to the cast recording of the more recent, I believe it was the 2009 London revival with Rowan Atkinson as Fagan, who does. But how much of how much of that time were you asleep? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I, I survived it. I, I listened to it when you're on a bike and you're going like 13 miles an hour. It's like, oh, OK, I, 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 yeah. I gotta stay awake for this. OK, OK. And it's dull. <laughs> to say the least, there's not um, very much that happens. All of well, yeah, the cool. thing about how Dickens had to write books in his day is much like Victor Hugo with Les Mis, he was written by the, or paid by the page. So the more he wrote and the more meandering subplots he would write, the more he would get paid. 
Yeah. So that's why you jump from little boys to girl and bar to like robbers and artful dodgers and all that shit all over the place. No structure. Yeah. And it's just it is a slog to get through because there is so many characters that have no purpose. I mean, we keep cutting back to these characters only for the climax to be between like the town folk and this one guy that we've barely seen. (laughs) <laughs> like the main villain i think has maybe one song in the entire show and it's in the second act but he has a presence andrew <laughs> no you he feel his doesn't. presence no he fucking doesn't he does not <laughs> so andrew tell me what happens in oliver oliver is a boy who works at a workhouse i assume he's forced to work there or he's like an orphan or something like yeah that. he's an orphan uh so it's it's like you know and you hate orphans. I do hate orphans, so they do deserve the workhouse. That's fine. Um, <laughs> but, you know, he doesn't like the workhouse, which is also fine. Uh, then the people the people that run the workhouse, like, sell him off to a grave digger? If a I'm funeral not mistaken. home, basically. Yeah. And then he doesn't like them, so he runs <laughs> away from them. Uh, and then he meets, like, a child thief gang run by a guy named fagin and he kind of rides with them for a little bit until he robs some uh richer couple and gets caught no he Uh, doesn't get caught like another boy like robs him and then like blames it on oliver okay yeah but he's the one that gets blamed for it he gets he gets caught for the robbery he gets caught he he gets the the yeah and then the rich couple is like we're gonna take care of him because i don't know we just want to i guess and then the whole time there's this guy bill sykes who is also part of fagin's gang kind of eventually shows up and there's another character nancy who i haven't even mentioned yet but she and oliver talk sometimes i think (laughs) and she's dating bill sykes because she loves bill sykes even though bill sykes is like actually abusive and horrible he like, like physically beats the shit out of her. Yeah, like so, you know, that's cool. Uh Bill Sykes is the bad guy, so at least there's that. Um and then Bill Sykes kidnaps Oliver for some reason. They, they didn't want Oliver to tell on them where he's where their like little child army is. Oh, okay. Like honestly, I didn't even the once you get to the second act, I like barely even followed what was happening. Uh, Bill Sykes kidnaps Oliver, I guess, for that reason. He didn't want them to find Fagin's hideout. Um, and then Bill Sykes hangs himself from an accident. No, he gets shot. No, he gets shot. And then like he was trying to cross between two beams and then gets shot in the process while he has a rope around him. Yeah. And then he falls and he's hanging from the rope and then they shoot him again. Yeah. And then that's just a double tap it. Yeah. Oh, and he killed Nancy. Uh, Oh, yeah. He beats Nancy Nancy to death for no reason. She does not. That is not a character that needs to be beaten to death. What happens in the book? I looked that up. It does have that's in the book. So Ebenezer um, Scrooge deserved to be beaten to death. The thing is, in in the book, there's like an explicit like Fagin lies and says that Nancy is going to betray Sykes. Yeah, I don't think that's in here. No, Uh, Bill Sykes just kills her for no real reason. Uh, And then he killed her because she was helping Oliver like yeah which Even though oliver really cool didn't with. do anything either but you know <laughs> it was more like you you threatened my dick size woman by like you know standing up to me fuck you i'm gonna beat you to death with this symbol of my hubris yeah um there's also some stuff in there about uh this other couple which i think is the couple that runs the workhouse and it is so fucking ridiculous and irrelevant And it just shows up like even towards the end of the show, they're still showing up and they have nothing to do with fucking anything. And I I, I don't even. (laughs) And then the show just ends. It's just like, oh, it's over. (laughs) So, Andrew, I posted your initial reaction to the end of Oliver on Twitter. Yeah. And asked people to guess what it was. They eventually got it because Emily Clark, friend of the show, Emily Clark, basically was like, oh, this is the only show it couldn't be. <laughs> and then put that out there. And one of our p- fans basically said, um, um, yeah, something was resolved. Andrew's wrong. What was it? Um, the conflict of Oliver versus homelessness resolved. <laughs> he wasn't homeless at the start of the show, though. Yeah, he was. He was in a workhouse. That's basically he had a That's house, not, not a home. I, I mean, yeah, but if you want to argue that he was homeless, he wasn't homeless. Like he was even given he was at two different homes. He was even sold off to another home. 
He just didn't like that home, so he ran away. Like, you can't say that, like, oh, at the start he's homeless, and then at the end he's not. Like, he doesn't become homeless until, like, midway through the show. (laughs) What do you think of the character of Fagin, who is, like, one of Dickens' most iconic characters, for God knows why? Um, yeah, if you go to his Wikipedia page, there's a whole lot of stuff about anti-Semitism, so that's really cool. Uh, (laughs) What? (laughs) (laughs) Please elaborate on that, sir. Uh, hey, Bree, you want to help us with this? Uh, Fagin on uh, Wikipedia. Yeah, Fagin on Wikipedia. Let's let's. Fa- why is that he anti-Semitic? Maybe I don't understand. I didn't read the book, and I'm not pretending to. Is it? Is his character Jewish? I, I mean, yeah, he wants money, but okay. <laughs> Literally, if you look up the Wikipedia page and look at the look at the watercolor that was painted in 1889 of this character. Is his name literally Fagin the Jew? Dude, he literally looks like, what is that caricature? The Smiling Merchant or whatever? The uh, Merchant of Venice? Whatever it is. It's it's like the really fucking racist, like... Do you guys see that? Yeah. That's, yeah, that's uh, hella racist. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, that's kind of what he looks like in the show, though, isn't it? I <laughs> they mean... Got, they trim the beard I, a bit. Maybe. I... Uh, wow. Maybe I just wasn't thinking anti-Semitism when I was watching this children's musical. Okay, well, while I was watching, there's an entire uh... Wikipedia page called "Racism in the Work of Charles Dickens." (laughs) And it's like, (laughs) holy shit! Yeah. Other than that, though, we'll go we'll go beyond that because I mean that's that's one thing. But in the musical, it's not really played up that way. So to be fair, um. But I don't quite understand why he's so popular. He really should be the main villain. They should just do away with the Bill Sykes character and just have it be Fagin as the villain. But you I feel like they want Fagin to be more like a Tenardier like character. I know this predates Les Mis by many years, but yeah. But like Fagin himself is a thief, which, OK, if you want to argue that, like, you know, thievery is not necessarily a villain thing fine but he also is abusing children to do the thieving for him so you know that's that's still child labor (laughs) can i talk once again about the the anti-semitism of this character sure what do you got um so the composer of the show um lionel bart he wrote the book he wrote the music wrote the lyrics he is a jewish man Um, And he wrote the songs for the character with a Jewish rhythm and Jewish orchestration, basically embracing it and trying to reframe it. Um, In spite of this, Jewish playwright Julia Pascal believes that performing the show today is still inappropriate, an example of a minority acting on a stereotype to please a host society, saying that U.S. Jews are not exposed to the constant low-level anti-Semitism that filters through British society. Um... But in contrast, David Schneider, who studied it with for a PhD in Yiddish, found the Dickens novel wherein Fagin is simply the Jew is a difficult read, but saw Fagin in the musical as a complex character who is not the baddie. So there's still a lot of debate going on about that. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. Um, And I think the musical tones it down. I mean, I haven't read the novel, obviously, but yeah, we let's say like we have the no history with the show i specifically do not we were given this as a patreon request and we're kind of like it was boring (laughs) funnily enough it's actually in the disney version uh oliver and company which is the one i'm actually most familiar with uh fagan is the uh good guy like the hero uh uh, bill sykes is uh, portrayed as uh like a mafia boss who is uh abusing fagan and fagan owes him money basically uh and also they do away with the whole uh, child labor ethics because it's dogs. dogs. So <laughs> instead, it's like a dog fighting ring. I haven't seen the movie, but I'm assuming uh, the dogs want to help him. So it's kind of the dogs want to fight. They're like Pokemon. That's what Michael yeah. Vick said in court. Well, they don't they don't fight. They still steal. <laughs> oh, OK. <laughs> well, that was a tangent and a half, but I feel like we all learned something there. Not going to lie. Yeah, I, you know, I did a little research for this one. <laughs> oh, yeah, you brought your A game here. Um, but <laughs> Fagin as a character, like, I don't, I don't see him as, like, evil or anything like that. I mean, um, like, from the point of view there, he's nice to the kids and all that. 
Yeah, I think really the argument that could be best made against him is that, uh, you know, he, he is abusing children because it is, I mean, it is still child labor, which I think we can all agree is wrong. Uh, whether it's criminal labor or non-criminal labor, it is still right. wrong. Uh, and that's kind of the worst thing that he does. I think in the context of the show, thievery is not really seen as that bad. Um, so because it's got a Robin Hood mentality, like, yeah, they're yeah. stealing from the rich. So really what what's bad about him is the same thing that's bad about the other what is his name bumble or whatever the fuck that, that yeah. runs the workhouse bumble. like it's it's basically just kind of like the same thing uh and I, honestly I, I, more fun to watch yeah i think you could even if you planned out the show a little more than just kind of throwing shit at a wall uh you could have like a fagin and bumble kind of uh point counterpoint kind of thing where they're kind of the same one in the same but uh doing different things i don't know Wh whatever <laughs> so let's talk about lionel bart for a minute the guy that wrote the book the lyrics the music everything sure he, he that that is very rare um in the theater community for one like the only examples that are coming to the top of my head is like lynn manuel miranda and hamilton and jason robert brown in um my marriage is a sham and i cheated a lot the musical for the last five years yeah which are both well not both uh hamilton's longer but the last five years is like a short like one act isn't it yes and i'm sure there's more but those are the only two that really come to my head because there really is a focus on the lyricist and book writer and the songwriter like even sondheim as much as we love his work here he has never written his own book yeah so this was a real labor of love by lionel bart and fun fact, despite all like we know this musical, like even if you weren't in this podcast, you know, this musical exists. Yeah, I mean, I've heard uh, I think Food Glorious Food itself is is a pretty big, like mainstream pop thing. I've heard that song for sure. It's in it's in Ice Age 3, I'm pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> maybe two. It might be Ice Age 2. I can't quite remember. But more or less, he died without earning a cent off of this. Seriously? Yeah, because, like, you know, theater is a finicky thing, especially in the 60s. Damn. A real passion project, huh? Yeah, this is, like, a real big thing. He earned, like, 16 pounds a minute for the show, and that's it. A one-time payment. He got no royalties. And he died that's relatively a... young at, like, age 68 in 1999. Damn, he never made any money. He's gonna hire himself a fucking lawyer. Jesus Christ. <laughs> Yeah, it's fucked up. But the f fact is, you've got his songs that live on, and I feel like the songs really do live up. But I don't mean to talk shit about the dead, but I feel like this could have dealt with the book writer to come in and, you know, fix it all up. Can we talk about just how many fucking characters there are in this goddamn show? I mean, who we got? You want to list all the named characters? <laughs> OK, well, starting from who's introduced right away, I mean, Oliver and then Mr. Bumble, the workhouse owner, uh, the woman there. What's her name? Widow something? Widow Corny. Yeah. Um, then there's uh, Mr. Sourberry and Mrs. Sourberry, who are the funeral home people. Uh, they have a work hand that comes in for like one scene who is also Noah. named yep also a named character uh then we have the artful dodger uh and nancy and bill sykes who are all part of uh fagin's gang uh so there's like four more people right there um don't forget old sally the nurse at oliver's birth oh yeah and then uh what are the name of the rich family uh you got the the bedwins both of them as well mr and mrs bedwin um grimwig the foppish doctor and then the beetle is a character as well yes so uh how many fucking characters is that <laughs> too damn many but the thing is we remember most of them <laughs> um barely though is a thing and some of them like some of them come back and some of them just don't yeah, like, I think I, the sour berries don't come back. I don't think uh, the bumbles come back, though. Uh, they get married and they have like a they have their own song, don't they? Yep. Oh, my God. <laughs> what we're saying is and a lot of that stuff is cut in the movie. Like, I will say that. Well, and, and it should be. <laughs> mm hmm. Uh, this is the thing where I do not enjoy this show as a whole. I do not think it works as a show. I think the movie works better um, as boring as the movie is. I think the problem with Oliver Twist, as far as I can tell, and this is based off this adaptation and the Disney adaptation that I've seen, is Oliver is not the main character. No. And there really isn't a main character. <laughs> I mean, the closest thing, like, 
structurally, the musical don't make sense. Let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. I mean, so there we got, is no there is no like we got goal. two opening numbers, basically. Um, you have Food Glorious Food, which is an introduction to the workhouse. And that's followed up with Oliver, an introduction to Oliver. Pick one. You could have one or the other. You can't have both. I think Food Glorious Food is the I Want song. I disagree. I disagree because we got like five songs later um, to Where Is Love, which should be the I Want song. And the movie restructures to be the second song ish. If you consider Food for Glorious Food slash Oliver yes. Oliver to be the same one. But the problem is that song is like fucking 30 minutes into the show. So I don't think yes. you can count it. <laughs> but it is the I Want song for Oliver. <laughs> And it is the first song that can be considered really an I Want song. It's also the first song that only Oliver sings. Yes, it is the first real solo. And Oliver is the main supposed character. to be the main character, I think. Mm -hmm. At least this show is structured as if he is. Um, even though he he really doesn't do anything. He just kind of runs around and shit happens to him. He reminds me of Pinocchio, where he's just dragged from thing to thing dumb, dumbly. <laughs> Yeah, but even Pinocchio has like an actual goal that he's working towards. It does he? Yeah, he wants to be a real boy. I mean, I guess. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, if they kind of, they that show will not show that like movie. They kind of just fucking wizarded away in that at the end. But, you know, he still was working towards that or trying to. <laughs> in the book, he gets like hanged by the neck and then he just won't die. Well, yeah, he's not a real boy. He can't die. Yeah, that that, that book's real messed up. I'm excited for Guillermo del Toro's musical stop motion adaptation. I think that's going to be great. I think all fairy tales are really fucked up and Disney has kind of ruined them. Yeah. Um, all right. It's time for our favorite segment of the show. It's previews where she compares reviews of critics to what Justin and Andrew have to say and see where they line up. Ba -ba -da -ba. Breeze views. Roger Ebert reviewed the film saying the weakness in the stage musical Oliver is that they made too much of Oliver and didn't quite know what to do with him. Reed establishes Oliver as a bright, attractive young boy, gives him some scenes so we get to care about him and admire his pluck, and then focuses his movie on the characters who are really interesting, F Fagin, Bill Sykes, the artful Dodger, and Nancy. The movie belongs so much to Fagin and the Dodger, in fact, that when we see them marching down the road in their last scene, we think the movie should stop right there, instead of giving us a final look at Oliver. Describing the 1984 revival, Frank Rich of the New York Times stated Oliver is not unpleasant, just dull. Indeed, the first 40-odd minutes of the current production is as afflicted by rigor mortis as the stiffs in The Undertaker's Emporium, where the orphan hero briefly works. The evening gathers some steam once its two savvy stars, Ron Moody, Fagan, and Patty Lapone, Nancy, make their belated entrances. But even then, Oliver never becomes arousing. The only sustained outpouring of joy occurs in the full cast song melody of the curtain call. At a critic's preview, the audience's biggest hand was a chord to the villain Bill Sykes' dog. I am inclined to agree with Roger Ebert about the film specifically. They restructured it a bit to be much more about like Dodger and Fagin. I think and that also Dodger and Fagin are just more interesting characters in general, though. Oliver has nothing. <laughs> he has love in the end, kind of. He found it. Did he, though? Like, we barely see him interact with those other characters. You know, you're right, Andrew. I know the perfect way to restructure this. All right. So we start with Oliver. He is in like a workhouse and he's like cleaning every day. And then a uh, billionaire comes and picks him up and is oh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. come to my house and I mean, stay for a week. And then they fall in love. And then they 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 like then he's like i want my real parents then there's like a like contest whoever yep, becomes yep. oliver's real parents fifty thousand dollars um and, and this, this guy fagan <laughs> decides he's gonna pretend to be oliver's real pig real parents to and then to throws him, him off a bridge yep <laughs> then punjab comes down and saves the day okay honestly though is annie just uh oliver but they cut out the first act essentially it's oliver but better andrew it kind of is though and i hate to say I that I, yeah, I was about to say, I didn't think we'd ever come to a thing where we compared anything positively to Annie. The thing with but Annie, here we is are. they don't, they don't have, Annie doesn't have Fagin, and Fagin is a fun character. But it has Rooster, and he's a fun character. 
That's true. Um, this is why I think that we should we really should talk about Oliver and Company because Oliver and Company <laughs> makes Oliver into a cat that doesn't even fucking talk. Like the entire show, it maybe has three fucking lines. Like, <laughs> what should I worry? What should I care? Billy Joel is Dodger. Like, <laughs> why is he just Dodger? Is he no longer artful because he's a dog? Yes, dogs cannot be artful because they can't play piano. Because they're too fartful. All right, on that note, let's go on to a Mitchell announcement. Hey guys, sorry to interrupt you in the middle of the show, but we've got a shill at you. Um, yeah, like we've got a Patreon and we also have a lot of people on there. And what do we get from Patreon? You get commentaries. You get a weekly podcast that only the patrons get fucking drunk as shit every month <laughs> no 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 that's that's not happening again please understand that so i will never be wasted <laughs> i will say i did run a poll after the first patreon meetup everyone enjoyed it <laughs> there you go <laughs> so if you guys want to have fun and play games with me andrew Bree, and a special guest once a month come join our um ten dollar and up tiers like we got a lot of stuff and we also have some brand new tiers on patreon twenty dollars you can suggest a musical um that me and andrew do um like right now we we're only covering oliver because joseph Evan green wanted us to do it and it yeah thanks joseph Fifty dollars. Um, if you stay on for one month at the fifty dollar price point, you can make us read whatever you want on the podcast. Um, one full paragraph. Um, and we can we'll we'll just say it. Like you got got a, gonna propose to your girlfriend? How about Andrew and I propose for you? Man, I can't think of a worse idea. We would fuck that up so bad. <laughs> you guys would Hundred... probably break up immediately. <laughs> you guys would say some inappropriate shit, and then yeah, they'd break up. <laughs> A hundred dollars, Andrew, and they get to be a guest on this show. You want to sit here and talk about a musical with me and Andrew? Pay a hundred dollars for a full month. You can do it. Jess will be drinking that entire month in anticipation. <laughs> and I, Literally every day until I get there and then I just can't talk. It's going to be great. So who's currently on our Patreon, Andrew? Oh, let's see. We have quite a few. We've got uh, Terry Needleman, Max Lunig, Benjamin Learer, Lily Ackles, John Donna, Jess the Stampede, Ewan Cassidy, Haley McDonald, Taskier, Fire of September, Mina Maniri, Monica Thoreau, Brent Black, Haley Murray, Alice in Wonderland, B Way Flicks, Nathaniel Stacey Coombe, Luna Rocks 222, Irigail Drouet, Whiter, Carrie Ahern, Christine Malmadel, Mezzanine Theater Diary, Mary Lou Choquette, Anne Nunnally, Cole Birchfield, John Vanals, Holy Sticality, Russ Walker, Musical Hell, Emily Grace, Andrew Van Barson, uh, Emily Stack, Kyle Summer, Mr. B, Janae C, Kyle, Christina, Francis, Jessica A, Skylar, Liz Lim, Corey Wilmarth, Allison Stuller, Nothing is Certain Except Beth in Taxes, Ren uh, Cullen, Thespian, uh, Elizabeth Le- Levengood, Victoria Tribble, Alex, Joseph Evans Green, Wait in the Wings, uh, we know him, uh, Jamie Holland, and Spectacle Machine. They give us a little extra financial support that helps us keep the lights on here at Musicals with Cheese and pay Brie and keep her listening to our nonsense once a week. Once a week. And just know, like, with your like with your contributions, you're making sure that Brie has a house over her head right now. Just, just now, think about that. And I don't go hungry. Yeah. yeah. But we do have one other way if you'd like to support us and you don't want to get nothing out of it. Not that you get nothing out of the Patreon. Yeah, I'm about to say, they get sh- a lot of shit they out get of a our lot Patreon. Of shit. But if you want something physical, you know, like you want to have something in your hands from it. We had a fucking merch store. Let's go. <laughs> uh, we're selling we're, so much shit on there. <laughs> it's a uh, it is actually a lot of stuff. We got blankets, tote bags, T-shirts with a bunch of different designs. We've uh, got pet, masks, pet hoodies. I mean, come on. What, what do we not have here? And uh, it's on uh, teespring.com uh, slash musicals with cheese uh, store. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. I don't know. Apparently, remember like a few months ago when I was like, I don't want to be involved in this. I did it in a day because Andrew was so fucking lazy. He didn't ever do it. Yeah, that's what it was. Uh, all right. Yeah. Buy our shit and send us pictures of you wearing our shit. Yeah, we're excited to see people wearing it. Uh, and I'm going to get myself one of those fucking blankets because they look damn nice. I know I was. That's like <laughs> the first thing I knew I wanted. I want the tote bag. The tote bag is cool. So I, think, I think I'm going to order that. All right. Well, let's get back to the show then. Food. 
Food Glorious Food. Food Glorious Food. Is a weird song. What do you think of it as an opening number? Bad opening number. It doesn't really make sense. I mean, it, it makes sense, but it doesn't set, like, anything up other than that they want food. Y yes, and it's like, we gotta have all... I, logically, I understand why it's here, because we gotta set up, like, all the artful Dodger boys that we're gonna see in act l later in the act and give them something else to do aside from saying, I'll do anything and all that. Be back soon. Yeah, like we need to give them a, a little fun choral part in the opening part of the musical. I, I get it logistically. Oliver is a much better opening number than this, which is just like, oh, we want food. And really, it's just aiming to hedge us up for when he says, I want more. I also kind of feel like Food Glorious Food as a song is really fun. But you could have had the Thief Gang sing it later in the show. Yes. Um, you didn't have to put it here. Like, you could have fit it in somewhere else. And also, it's very fair for me to say this is very early on in the world of musical theater. Like, Oklahoma was only a few years before this and all that. Like, this is still a musical theater in its infancy. So when I say all these things, yeah, it's hard to see it. It's easy to say it. Like, what is it? 50 years later? Yeah. Uh, what what years? what it does help with though is is if you're trying to do a revival of this, yes, you know, it might be okay to restructure a little bit. <laughs> um, apparently Cameron McIntosh is trying to remake this as a film, um, starring Samantha Barks as Nancy, and Stephen Daldry, um, the most boring director I've ever seen directing. So may maybe he could do that. Yeah, I think a, a little bit of restructuring could help this show a lot, actually. Um, well, you seem um, to like Oliver quite a bit. I don't even like the song. I just think it works better as an opening number. Yeah, I don't think it's a particularly good song. I think Food Glorious Food is actually is more memorable as a song. But I think Oliver is better as an opening number to a musical titled Oliver. Oliver, Oliver, never before has a boy wanted more. Oliver, Oliver. Who does the more when he knows what's in store? There's a sortie chimney long overdue for a sweeping out which will push him. Is it weird that like Oliver doesn't get his own song so, till so late, though? Yes, it is. In we fact, just start we start focusing on Mr. Bumble, who is not a major character, secondary character at best. Tertiary, like I, I wouldn't even call him <laughs> secondary. <laughs> <laughs> like and he he gets the next like three songs. <laughs> Uh, it's a bad choice um and the movie corrects that by basically after oliver there's just a little bit of boy for sale and then just straight into where is love and it works better yeah i mean that's if i were looking at this i i think that would be the first thing i would do is just drop all the shit with mr bumble i would cut mr bumble from the second act too because honestly what yes. the fuck is he even doing there what why <laughs> get rid of this character <laughs> He's bringing the laughs. He's bringing the chuckles. There is no laughs to be had when he's here. I'm sorry. This really isn't a comedy show. It's not that funny. <laughs> what are you talking about? A girl gets beaten to death. Hilarious. <laughs> Honestly. Y'all are missing Bree's face right now. <laughs> Beating women isn't it funny. It isn't funny. Until That's they the die, joke. then it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> okay oj simpson um <laughs> whoa nothing was ever proven <laughs> he, he 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 lost the civil court case so yeah something was proven he remember is the when, reason remember when, remember when he wrote that book and it was just titled i did it and then there was like if but it was like tiny <laughs> that was a request by the goldman family because yeah. he was originally just going to title it if i did it and then the goldman family was like no you're going to make the if really small and then just put i did it on the cover <laughs> because it's great because they run the entire um simpson estate um and yeah good for them um 
I guess we got to talk about the iconic ones now. Um, consider yourself. Consider yourself at home. Consider yourself one of the family. I've taken to you so strong. It's clear we're going to get along. Consider yourself well in. Consider yourself part of the furniture. In a lot to spare. Who cares what ever we got we share? If it's your chance to be, we just um yeah, this is where he first meets the Dodger. The yes. artful Dodger. The artful Dodger. And this song goes on for what it has to go on for 15 minutes, right? <laughs> it doesn't end. Uh they get the whole town involved and, and like everyone starts singing it. And I'm just like, what is fucking happening right now? <laughs> You're being entertained, Andrew. Don't you love theater? You're being entertained. It's gonna, it's, it's the escapism think, you thought think, you wanted when we started this show, Andrew. I think now I kind of feel like what you're saying when you don't like that they start dancing for no fucking reason. <laughs> Cause like this, they're just dancing for no fucking reason. <laughs> And I, I don't mean to be negative about this show. I get it. It's iconic and likely will last much longer than all three of us combined. Like life importance, like it will last beyond all of us. And we're just snarky Internet idiots. But you know what? It's fun to be snarky about shit that is fucking dated as fuck, though. I mean, come on. It is. It is. I think the song's catchy, though. <laughs> like legitimately catchy. Yeah, it's a fun song. Uh, I don't quite understand what it's about. It's just kind of a feel good song, I guess. Or like well, we a, got like three feel good songs right in a row. Yeah, because I think you've got to pick a pocket or two does everything that this song does. But like, again, <laughs> well, no, you got to introduce the Dodger. He gets his own song and then Fagin gets his own song. And then the Nancy and the group gets his own song. And then <laughs> Nancy, and the group and Oliver gets his own song. Yeah. And it's just like, why? Why is this happening? Um, let's just mash together. It's a fine life and I do anything because we because consider yourself and you've got to pick a pocket or two are basically a continuation of each other. Got to pick a pocket or two, boys. You've got to pick a pocket or two. Why should we go back home? Robin Hood, what a crook, gave away what he took. Charity's fine, subscribe to mine, get out and pick a pocket or two. You've got to pick a pocket or two, boys. Missed. <laughs> You've got to pick a pocket or two. Robin Hood was far too good, yes, pick a pocket or two. You gotta pick a pocket or two. I actually like a bit better, just because I think Fagin has a, a bit more fun with the song, and it doesn't have as much over the top whole town dancing for no reason. Bullshit and you also going hate on. kids in general when they sing. I mean, it's not like I hate that, but yeah, I don't know. Just it, kids don't have a developed voice, you know. It and I also feel a little awkward. It's like, how late at night are these kids up on stage? You know, like wh what's going on here? Child labor for the arts is still child labor. <laughs> <laughs> you know make a point andrew i feel like you should start picketing the the shows of annie and oliver and Dude, Matilda. If, I could, if if i could just get annie to stop playing forever <laughs> it would be my life dream come true no andrew what they're gonna do is they're still gonna play annie it's just they'll have full grown ass adults in my <laughs> that'd be funny as shit though i'll watch that <laughs> oh daddy warbucks and they're like fucking 18 <laughs> I'm so glad I'm a it's going to be like Chris O'Donnell in the Batman <laughs> movies. <laughs> Thanks for adopting me. My Thanks for adopting me, my dude. <laughs> I got to go into the bathroom and shave. <laughs> uh. um, what do you think of I do anything? It is 
is the iconic one. Um, is it? I've never heard only, of it before, I don't think. I only heard about it because Andrew Lloyd Webber. Oh, did I, I wonder if I've ever told you about this. Oh, this God. fucking wonderful thing Andrew Lloyd Webber did in the UK for many years. Anytime he was doing a big revival or bringing back a show um, like Superstar, he would basically have a mini American Idol session of who is going to play the big leading role in this. Oh, my new God. production. He did one for Su Jesus Christ Superstar. And he had like all these Jesuses from around the world come audition and they all had to compete against each other. And for when he revived the Wizard of Oz, oh, who's going to be Dorothy? Place your votes at home. And for this, um, it was who's going to be Nancy in the revival of Oliver. And it was the show was titled I Do Anything. Bro, that's pretty cringe. It was pretty cringe. <laughs> but that's where a lot of like British famous people came from like samantha barks who would go on to play eponine in the lay Miz movie that's where she's got her start uh well you know that's britain for you you can't stop them can you no um i find this song cringe in a weird way of like it's like when your mom's friend is like oh you're in love with me to like the the five-year-old yeah why is why does i'm just looking at why does bill sykes not have a song here i don't know dude we have like five songs introducing Fagin's gang and Bill Sykes doesn't have anything. He doesn't even have a I part. I think in any it's of like the mindset of once you your villain starts singing, they stop being scary, which eventually we've grown out of in like modern days. But I can see the argument for that. But the villain song is always the best song. Well, they didn't really have villain songs yet. Like the think about it like this. At this point, the only villain song really on Broadway was Lonely Room from fucking Oklahoma, which is a great villain song and one of my favorites. But that was the only one. Fair, fair. And looking at the list of songs, Bill Sykes has fucking one song. And Nancy has like 25. Yeah. And they don't have any songs together, even though they're supposed to be a couple. I mean, they're not a good couple. Well, no, but even bad couples usually get songs together. All right. Um, I know you want to talk about Be Back Soon because it's your favorite song of the entire show. I just for some reason remember this song. Be Back Soon. I don't <laughs> I don't know why I remember this song. You can go, but be back soon. You can go, but while you're working, this place I'm pacing round until you're home, safe and sound. Fare thee well, but be back soon. Who can tell where danger's lurking? Do not forget this tune. Be back soon. It's also, this is the fucking act one closer. <laughs> the robbery is, but yeah, this is, it's dumb. <laughs> this is the last song that's like sung. Yeah. <laughs> just like, what? It's so pointless too, aren't they? They're literally just singing about how they're going to come back soon. Well, then it's immediately juxtaposed because Oliver doesn't come back. I, yeah. I get it. They're trying to cram. Yeah, they're going to be back, aren't they? They promised. Yeah, no, it's, it's, the, it's, it's like when they, when, uh fucking black widow was like oh, i'll be back in a minute haha <laughs> and then she was yeah we know she no wasn't because the movie never came out and will never come out oops <laughs> <laughs> um i don't really want to linger on this song too much but i do want to talk about the structural change of it um in the movie compared to the musical um sure so in the musical um papa by nancy is the start of the second act Especially when they've been on the gin or the beer. <laughs> if you've got the patience, your own imaginations will tell you just exactly what you want to hear. Is there a cause for why she's singing it? Like, really? I, I think she just kind of is like, ah, oh, let's hang out and be fun. Yeah, honestly, I don't fucking remember at all. I, and honestly, the only part of that has impact that had any impact on me w during act two at the opening here is uh, when Mrs. Bedwin starts singing Where is Love? Because it's like, oh, that's a song mm -hmm. that I remember. That, OK, 
Oh, we're back in the story. OK. <laughs> yeah. But in the movie, they move Um Papa to like close to the end, basically, as a distraction song so she can sneak Oliver away from Bill. So she gets this bar all up and dancing and singing so she can sneak Oliver away. So they moved it from the pointless start of Act Two, which technically is where it should be in a stage musical, to an actual plot relevant piece. And basically the last time you see Nancy alive. Yeah, I think that as the last song she sings, it's not very good. I mean, it's kind of like look at her ingenuity and smarts as opposed yeah. to her just singing as long as he needs me. Yeah, which well, let's talk about that shit now. In spite of what you say, I'm sure that he needs me. Who else would love him still when they've been you? So ill, he knows I always will. As long as he needs me, I miss him so much when he is gone. But when he's near me, I don't let on the way I feel. Inside the love I have to hide The hell I've got my pride As long as he needs me That song is kind of depressing. Like That song is depressing. horrific. And people like have sung it on their albums. Barbara Streisand sings it like people perform it live. And it's about a girl justifying why she's with her abusive boyfriend. Yeah. I mean, I can understand a song like that existing as long as it's framed properly. I don't know if I can say that this is framed properly. It is not. Because <laughs> um, I've heard this song independently of this musical for years. And I was like, oh, it's just about a girl that's like dedicated to her boyfriend. Then I watch it in context and I'm like, what the fuck? Oh, it's about a girl that's dedicated to her abusive boyfriend that then kills her. <laughs> yeah right before he kills her she's singing like oh, as long as he like and i've never done nothing wrong i never betrayed you and then he just beats her beats to her death. to death uh in the um apparently in the book there's a, a scene because everyone likes bill sykes dog there's a part where bill sykes kills his dog or attempts to uh as well so you know I'm glad the movie and the musical didn't do that, because that would be one step too far. You can abuse women, but as soon as you get into animal abuse, man, that character is unredeemable. I mean, Bill Sykes is pretty unredeemable, but... Yes, he is. That was irony, Andrew. Yeah. Um, although, I guarantee uh, people actually would have responded more more heinously to a, a dog being killed than a woman being killed. But, you know, that just says something about our society. Uh, yeah, society. <laughs> <laughs> um... <laughs> <laughs> All right, there's only one more song to talk about. Literally just one. Um, Actually, that's a lie. I got one other one. Are we, are we going to talk about reviewing the situation? or? Yes, but I want to talk about one before that. I, I lied. OK, what do you want to talk about? The secretly best song in this show that literally has no point to be in it is pointless, but I love it anyways and is the only one I like re-listened to and re-watched. OK. Is Who Will Buy? <laughs> Wonderful morning, such a sky. 
I don't remember this song. <laughs> it's no plot relevance. It just falls over you. But like in the moment while it's happening, I'm like, this is like the most gorgeous song. It is secretly the best sounding, prettiest like number in the entire show. And it's just like this big number like who will buy these red flowers? And it like everyone it starts with just Oliver and then the re- it's like consider yourself, but a lot more melancholy and pointless. OK, let's talk about this, though. Why is this completely pointless, irrelevant plot song this late into the fucking show? Yes, that was what I was going to bring up in the movie. They put it sit, put it right after the intermission because the movie has an intermission. And I think it works so much better there. OK, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I, it stands out better there, and it's just prettier there, too. I think the real reason it's here, though, is because Oliver doesn't have a song in Act 2, if this isn't here. Yes. Which, I mean, there goes him being the main character, right? <laughs> All right. All right. Reviewing the situation. Reviewing the situation. Can the fellow be a villain all his life? All these trials and tribulations. Better settle down than get myself a wife. And the wife can cook and sew for me and come for me and go for me and go for me and nag at me. The fingers she would wag at me, the money she would take from me, the misery she'd make for me. I think I'd better think it out again. I don't really like this song, actually. Explain, I'm curious. It doesn't really have much purpose, and literally the entire song is just, he's like, oh, am I going to change my ways? And then the end of the song is just, oh, I'm not going to change my ways. And that was it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I think this I'm going to agree with you that I agree that content wise, I don't love it. Lyrically, this is possibly the one song where the lyrics really stand out. Yeah, I mean, he, they play around with it a lot and it, it's not like bad, but I don't know. And I appreciate that because I'm like, wow, those rhymes are like actually really good. The song kind of feels like the entire show, though, where it's just like nothing happens. <laughs> I mean, stuff happens. It's just... You know, it's like dive into the head of Fagin and like we know what this guy's about for the moment he came on screen. Not going to lie. Yeah. And that's really the last song of note in the show, because everything else is a reprise. Mr. Yeah. Bumble comes back for a reprise because, you know, everyone wanted to see him. Uh, Nancy gets fucking killed after reprising her song. Um, Fagin does the same song again. And then and the then show's then, over. Food, the show's over. glorious food. Yeah. Um, they do have the big set piece with uh, Bill Sykes hanging from a, a rope. You know, that's cool. Wow. Call call Cameron McIntosh. Like, <laughs> yeah, fuck the chandelier crashing. Fuck that barricade. Like, we got a man dangling from a rope. Yeah. I mean, back when this came out, that probably was like a big deal. It was like, wow. What are you talking <laughs> about? You can go to the city square and see that any day you want. Well, that's I mean, that's real, though. This is this is like fake stuff. <laughs> <gasps> all right andrew what is your yeah. overall thoughts on oliver and your cheese rating oh my goodness oh boy um oliver is bland and i didn't feel very much going in or coming out of it um i can't say it's like bad because it, like the music is is fine and there's some songs that are pretty good. I don't know if I would call this like a classic, though. Like this is this is like an old show that's like it feels like a, a proto musical. Like they haven't quite figured out how to actually tell a story yet. <laughs> I don't know. There's too many fucking characters. If they cut out like half of the characters and then told a tighter story that I think I could get behind it. Um, but as it is right now, it's it's a slog to get through and I don't think I recommend it. Um, as far as the cheese goes here, go cheese dot com, right? That's the good one. Yeah, that's that's the king of all the cheeses. That is king of cheese. Um, you got to give it some bland cheese, though. I mean, British British cheese, I'm sure is bland as fuck. I guess I'm going to give it aged British cheddar. Uh, because that sounds pretty fucking bland and uh, this this show has not aged well. So that's fair. Bree, how would you rate our discussion? 
Um, I'm going to give you a stinking bishop because while the um, show itself was not great or smelly like the stinking bishop cheese, um, you guys take first place in reviewing it. Wow. Like it took first place in the smell festival in Britain. Or something along those lines. That's what I'm I read. I'm <laughs> totally lost, but yeah, I'm done good with it. Well, Jess, uh, Jess, what do you think of the show? Um, I think the show has not aged great. <laughs> I can imagine it being very groundbreaking, and I can see that it is really an actual labor of love from Lionel Bart, and he deserved a lot more um, attention and praise for the work that he did while he was alive. Um, and I'm glad that his work lives on, but as a show itself, it's a bit of a slog to watch, not going to lie. Yeah, cheese. Um, there's only one cheese I can rate it, and I am going to send y'all the link in the Zoom chat. Oh, boy. And Bree is going to use that clip and play it right now. Cheese, glorious cheese. Tastes mighty and biting. Cheese, glorious cheese. It's so tantalizing. Whether you like it saucy, snappy, mild, or wild, Real cheese has a taste for you. Enjoy cheese, marvelous cheese, wonderful cheese, glorious cheese. So in case you didn't know, the American uh, Cheese Company took the song Food Glorious Food from Oliver and made it Cheese Glorious Cheese. Um, so my cheese rating can only be Cheese Glorious Cheese. Ah, tastes mighty inviting. The American Cheese Company. Wow. Great job, Jess. You, you really dug up the gems on this one. I, I like how even when I win, you won't let me win. <laughs> <laughs> you will never give me a, a sincere reaction on this show ever. You know, that's fine. Well, well that's you know who else is fine? <laughs> our patrons? Yes, our wonderful patrons. Thank you guys for listening. Um, please follow us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, at Musicals with Cheese. Our Twitter is Cheesy Musicals with an extra E. Um, Patreon is Musicals with Cheese. We got a lot of shit. Listen to the Mitch Show. We talked about that a bunch. Um, our Instagram is Musicals with Cheese. Our YouTube page is Musicals with Cheese. We have a patron-only podcast currently about Fosse Verdon. We got got some cool shit. And Andrew and I might be doing a commentary on Oliver and Company to coincide oh, with this. Oh, it's going to happen. It's coming out. It's probably going to come out right on the same day. I'm hoping for that. I hope hope the schedule will work out um our musical our email is musical theater lives at gmail.com if you hated what we had to say about oliver because it was your favorite thing and you sang as long as he needs me at your spring summer concert and you you're really butthurt about us insulting it so much shoot us an angry email there Hit us our, up. T- our title card is created by the absolutely incredible jolene casco follow her on instagram at jolene casco this show is produced by the absolutely wonderful the incredible the wonderful brianna jones Woo! um so if there's anything that you liked editing wise about this maybe maybe you should send her a tweet about how great she is all right um thank you guys for listening um is there anything else you want to say before we wrap this up you guys Food, glorious food, tastes mighty inviting. (laughs) (laughs) All right, and we'll see you next time on Musicals with Cheese. (laughs) 